Joining us now here in studio is Rob Leone. He is the progressive conservative member of the legislature for the riding of Cambridge, and it's nice to have you in that chair. Nice to see you, Steve. Your first time uh, here at TVO since you got elected as uh, an MPP last time out, so let's just find out a bit about you. Where are you from originally? Well, I was, um, I'm an MPP for Cambridge. It's where I was born and raised. Uh, have a young family, two kids, uh, and a, a wife who's a, a clinical psychologist in the region of Waterloo. And before you got elected, what'd you do? I was professor of political science, actually, so I guess this is a little bit of my co-op term here. Professor of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier? That's right. You, um, you wrote a PhD thesis. That's right. When you went to McMaster. So do I have to call you Dr. Leone, actually? Hey, if you want to. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure my constituents just love to call me Rob, but okay. uh, if you want to call me doctor, I'm sure uh, I'll, I'll let it pass. Okay, Doc. What was the topic of your thesis, Doc? Yeah, I was, uh, the, the dissertation was on ministerial resignations, actually. And uh, it was about government decisions on how they make ministerial resignations. So it was a we, we, we comparative study about uh, uh, 40 years of uh, cases at the federal level in Canada and in Britain, and uh, it was a comparative analysis of how governments decide how ministers and when ministers should resign. Why did you pick that topic? Uh, it was an interesting topic to me. Uh, I always had an interest in sort of the ins and outs of Parliament and uh, our parliamentary institutions. At the heart of it is ministerial responsibility, a foundational principle of our parliamentary system. And uh, I wanted to focus on what, what I consider one of the main foundational principles of ministerial responsibility. It's interesting that we are, uh, I, I'm here at Queen's Park and now talking about the very same thing I studied for many years. Well, so this is why we invited you in here, because this is not an academic exercise for you anymore. This is actually what you do for a living now. That's right. So explain, let, let's just really go back to first principles here. You, you're in a situation right now where you are calling for the resignation of a particular minister on the other side of the house, and in fact, you have started a contempt effort against him. So tell me how this actually begins. How do you begin to write a motion of contempt against a cabinet minister? Right. Well, you know, th this has uh, been months in the making. We, uh, I sit on the Estimates Committee of the Legislature and the PC lead on the Estimates Committee. We uh, asked uh, for the Minister of Energy to be the first uh, ministry that we examined in estimates. Uh, we asked for 15 hours of examination because uh, during the election we had some serious concerns about the politically motivated decision to cancel the Mississauga gas plant and before the election we had some serious concerns about the Oakville uh, cancellation as well. So we wanted to talk about uh, and find out more about what happened in, S uh, in the Ministry of Energy and the decisions that led to that and whether they were in fact politically motivated. So we had an opportunity at estimates to ask those questions. We didn't get very many answers in estimates. So then we started a, a process of requesting documents uh, from the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Energy and the Ontario Power Authority. Uh, we gave the minister two weeks to produce those documents and after that two, week, two weeks had expired, Essentially, uh, they wrote a letter, uh, one from the minister, one from the OPA, stating that, uh, that they weren't going to be forthcoming with documents because of con commercial sensitivity and other issues. Um, that wasn't satisfactory. As you know, uh, we have a, a parliamentary tradition where p if the legislature requests documents that they should be provided. We have examples from the federal government, uh, particularly the Afghan detainee issue, where this has uh, been a part of uh, what, what has happened there. We followed that precedent. And uh, we went forward with a contempt motion on the basis of what happened in, in Ottawa. So uh, fast forward to the end of the summer, our legislature gets called back a couple weeks early. We, uh, I raised a point of privilege saying my, mem my, uh, my privileges as a member of the House have been breached. And they have been breached because you asked for information, did not get it, and therefore you can't do your job if That's you don't right. get that information. I mean, we're, in, we're in the Estimates Committee. The Estimates Committee is, uh, is delegated the authority of uh, examining the estimates of, of the budget. And if we don't have information to do that, uh, we, we can't do our jobs properly. In reality, we asked the minister very upfront, you know, you, you have these cancellation costs, where in the estimates are they associated? Where can we find them? And if you don't have them in the estimates, how does it affect your budget? So we asked these questions in committee, we didn't get any answers, and that's why we proceeded uh, to, to file a motion, a point of privilege on the fact that we didn't get those documents. So there was some time uh, for the speaker to consider the contempt, uh, the point of privilege, and uh, early in September he decided uh, that there was a prima facie breach, which meant that on the face of it, there was a breach of my privileges that we were entitled to those documents. So the speaker ordered the government to bring them forward. Right, and so he said, uh, you know, we'll give you t till September 24th uh, to come to an agreement between the House leaders. If the House leaders didn't come to an agreement, uh, then there would be an opportunity for me to bring a motion of contempt. And the motion of contempt uh, was, was uh, uh, done at the end of September. Now that's what I want to follow up on. All right. Do you write that motion? 
uh, yeah, well, we're, we're writing in concert with our staff and uh, we're, we're being advised by the clerks as well. So those... Because I uh, presume it's got to be pretty... That's I mean, right. Know, all I, the I's got it and T's crossed for it to be legit, right? That's right. I mean, we don't want to sound unreasonable either. We want to make sure that the, the motion will be a successful motion. And you'll note that uh, on the, uh, the Tuesday morning where I tabled the, no the motion, the speaker did make clear that we were working in concert with the clerk's office to make sure that the motion that we were presenting was legitimate and could be presented in a manner that would allow the legislature to investigate whether contempt exists. And that's what the, the motion actually does. It says, we need a committee to, to investigate. We could have gone out right and said, you know, the minister is in contempt because he hasn't received the, released those documents. But we really wanted to know, and what Ontarians, I think, are most interested in is the truth. So we decided that we would investigate it through a legislative committee. We chose the finance committee to do that. Uh, we're waiting for that finance committee to be struck so that we could actually pursue this. So they're going to strike it, they're going to study it, they're going to come up with a recommendation, send it back to the full house, presumably, and then a vote? That is exactly uh, the, the timeline. Okay. So we're looking at November 19th for the, the finance committee to write a report and have the vote. Uh... Did your background as a poli-sci prof help you in any of this? Well, I think it did. Uh, certainly, I, I know what uh, ministers should be doing, what shouldn't be doing. I, my PhD is in public policy and public administration, so there's uh, accountability and transparency is the general theme of what I studied when I was in university. Uh, and so, yeah, it did. Uh, I know the precedents as well. I know what happened at the Afghan detainee issue pretty intimately. So there was an opportunity for me to be a, a lead on this from my party's perspective because I had the, the academic training to do that. And I think a little bit of legitimacy too. When you've studied this for so long, you get a PhD in the, in the, in the, in the topic that you're able to speak with some authority on the issue. Well, let me pick up on that, legitimacy yeah. and authority and so on. The opposition have the majority on this finance committee that will study it. Absolutely. The opposition have a majority among all members of the Ontario legislature. Is it a foregone conclusion because of that, that you're going to come back with a case of contempt and the minister will be found in contempt? You know, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I think that really? well, I think parliamentarians want to look at this reasonably. Uh, I think that if the government had uh, taken us up on what we've asked for, if there had been some contrition, some apologies, some sort of understanding that they actually did make a mistake, that uh, they would have taken the winds out of the sails of the opposition in terms of the pursuit of contempt. The reality is we're sitting here, uh, you know, in, in the mid-October, looking at this issue still. We have no apology. We have no reason to believe that one's forthcoming. The government rhetoric has remained unchanged. There has been no contrition. Uh, they're leaving us no opportunity other than to, no other option other than to pursue contempt. Well, let me find out if that's true. You say no other option other than to find them in contempt. When was the last time anybody in the legislature was found to be in contempt of the legislature? Uh, well, it's been several years, uh, decades, uh, in fact, almost more than a century. I was going to say se more than a century, 1904, right? 1904, I think, was yeah. the last uh, time. There might have been something in the 1930s. So this is a big deal. Absolutely. This is to be found in contempt means what? Uh, well, you're, you're, you've broken the, 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 what, what's typically expected in the House. It's similar to being found in contempt of court. Um, and that's exactly what we have before us as legislatures. If we're going to find a minister in contempt, we have actually all the tools at our disposal, much like a, a judge would have. I know. You can send him to jail. I mean, that's uh, the reality. Is is exactly that. Would but you do that? I don't think. You know, look. I think people want to. Uh, what they're interested in is not the retribution and what we're going to put on Bentley, Minister Bentley. What, we're, what they're looking for is the truth. That's our main okay, objective. But you do have the option of putting him in jail if he's found in contempt. Is that something you could imagine this House doing? Uh, not at this stage. I don't think so. But look, this government has to apologize for what it's done. It has to admit it's made a mistake. Uh, that is the, the start. I think uh, an apology at, at first. Uh, so would that make it all go away if he apologized? No, I don't know. I'm not going to say make, make it all go away, but certainly the minister as a, as a start, as the government as a start, uh, is, is the best place to, to go. You know, the other options available to us, uh, we can censure the minister from the House, uh, which means that he can't uh, do his performance functions. The minister could resign as a do result of do do that? that. I absolutely think he has to, uh, particularly in the, with the revelations that we had recently with the release of 20,000 documents as, a, as, as some sort of an oops on the part of uh, the you, government. You don't accept the explanation that, that his civil servants just didn't do quite detailed enough search for those documents? Well, the reality is the minister himself had, uh, had offered a, a letter of attestation that he's released all those documents. And that 
ha uh, that letter has obviously proven, been proven false. Well, presumably that letter is based uh, on what his people told him, though. Well, that, that he's got an issue with his people. The reality is he is the minister. This is a government that is, uh, is, is at, the, at, the, uh, uh, at the forefront of this issue, which is uh, an issue of contempt, of misleading the House, misleading Ontarians, frankly, about what happened at Oakville and Mississauga. And the reality is that they have to come clean with it. And we're going to be more willing to accept an explanation uh, that has some sort of contrition to it rather than the second, the, no explanation at all and no acceptance of blame or that, this, that they've in fact made a mistake. Let me follow up on that, Rob, because sure. as you would certainly know, uh, ministers are responsible for what happens in their departments, even if what happened in their departments took place before they got there. That's right. And we know that the decisions to cancel the Oakville power plant, to cancel the Mississauga power plant, were not made by this minister and were not even made while this minister was the minister. Yep. Does any of that matter? Well, I, you know, the government itself had uh, has an example of this. This is David Kaplan took the fall for e-health uh, when he wasn't the minister when it happened. George Smitherman was. So they have actually set the precedent themselves in terms of how to deal with this. And this is a precedent that's long-standing, a long-standing history. But the reality of contempt, even though the minister did not make the decision to cancel the plants, in fact, the minister revealed in committee that this was, uh, this was done by the Liberal campaign team and Minister of Finance in the middle of the campaign. Re reiterated the same thing because the polling numbers were, were going down. They had to make this decision. The reality is it's the minister who did not release the documents. It's a government who ordered the minister, perhaps, uh, I, I believe the government is implicated uh, as a, this is a massive cover-up. Uh, because they Sorry, haven't. This is a massive cover-up. I, I believe it is because you, you have uh, a, a, a release of documents that doesn't include anything coming to or from the minister. Not very much in, in the way of that. This is a political decision. We don't have very much in the way of uh, you know interaction between the ministry and the, and the premier's office. Well, what do we uh, need to know that we don't now know? We know what it's going to cost, don't we? Well, we need to know who made the decision. Uh, we still don't know who made the decision at the end of the day. They what? said it's a campaign team, but they didn't. Uh, they haven't provided the name of who actually made that decision. Well, the Premier made it, presumably. Well, Premier. you'd think that he would be acknowledged in that, but the reality is that the Premier left his cabinet in the dark, and that actually comes through in the documents that we've, we've now seen, is that the fact that the Premier has made a decision and left cabinet in the dark, and in fact it's left bureaucrats in the Ministry of Energy scrambling to find, find out a way to make the payments that they ha they're obligated to make on the, uh, as a result of what's happened. But I guess the question here is, given that, yes, it was a recommendation from the campaign team in the middle of the campaign to kill this power plant in Mississauga, presumably to help save some of those seats in Mississauga and Etobicoke, they can't make that decision by themselves. At the end of the day, the Premier of Ontario decides whether or not that plant's going to be shut down, right? 100%. He okay. has a responsibility In for which it. case, shouldn't the contempt motion be against the Premier as opposed to his minister? Well, the contempt motion is about the, the not releasing the documents. That is the minister's uh, responsibility. We believe that there is a second contempt motion that, that should be heard in the House. We actually made the point today after 1 p.m. Uh, before the, uh, the economic statement was released. And uh, that contempt motion says that uh, you've misled the House, you knew, this falls at your doorstep, uh, that you just don't make a mistake that 20,000 pages of documents uh, happen on a Friday afternoon. Uh, you knew that this was happening two weeks before you actually released those documents. Why did it take so long to inform the House? We believe there is a second contempt motion that should be brought forward. Uh, against the Premier. Against the Premier, against the Minister of Energy, against the House Leader, against the entire Liberal government. Because at the end of the day, they do take responsibility as a government collectively for the decisions that they've made. Now, Bentley's a lawyer. Do you think part of the punishment, if he is found to be in contempt, ought to be disbarment? Well, that's obviously a, a question for the, uh, the Law Society of Canada to make. Uh, again, I'm not really focused on what the retribution is. My interest is what the truth is, what happened with the, the, the decisions that have been made. These are politically motivated. Uh, we believe they're part of a, a broader scheme of a liberal seat saver program. This one, in fact, cost, uh, the, every time we turn a page in the document, we see another $100 million. Uh, of costs that we didn't know of before. So we're over a billion dollars now with the, with, the re, with the cancellation of the Oakville and Mississauga gas plants. Politically motivated decisions to save seats in the GTA in a very close election that they could have lost. So uh, that is the reality. I think that's what Ontarians want to know. And they're, they're interested in the truth. And I'm interested really, this isn't really about Minister Bentley. This is about the truth. This is about the government being part of a broader scandal uh, of cover up and scandal. I take your point on that, but of course this is all this is all within the realm of politics. Absolutely. And while your side has accused them of doing this to save seats, they are accusing you of doing this, A, as a partisan witch hunt, and B, 
because Bentley is thought to be one of those guys who potentially could take over for Dalton McGinty when, McG when McGinty retires. And wouldn't it be good for the opposition if you could pretty much damage the career of one of McGinty's potential successors? How much of that is at play here? Well, look, I, I think that... You can't tell me none, right? You well, can't say none. You know, there, we're, we're in a political game. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, and this is part of what we do. And I'm sure if we were on the other side and this happened to us, that they would be pursuing the, those ends. But again, you know, the Minister of Energy, Chris Bentley, who is the Minister of Energy, who is a highly regarded member of the House, uh, you know, the Liberals have made lots of claims about his honorability and his distinguished uh, public service, and I'm not going to dispute... Uh, that record uh, in the slightest. I am upset, of course, and in fact disgusted at the fact that he hasn't released documents that we've requested as per the traditions of our House. But the reality is if Minister Bentley cared about his own integrity, he cared about his own uh, political future, that he would come up and say something about this. This wasn't his decision. This wasn't, uh, he, he's, he's, he's the fall guy uh, of the Premier. If he wanted to, to care about his reputation, he should have stand, stood up and said something. Said what? Well, you know that this wasn't his fault, that this, these documents could have been released earlier. There's nothing in the documents that, uh, that would have uh, prevented him from continuing in his job. The reality is there has to be some reason why he has not produced those documents. And I think he was told, don't produce the documents. It might have implicated one of his fellow cabinet ministers. And it might have implicated the premier. The reality is he's, the, he's in control of his own destiny. If he said, I'm sorry, here are the documents, you know, he would have saved himself a lot of grief. But the reality is he hasn't done that. He's chosen to continue to be the fall guy of a premier who has, uh, in my opinion, lost touch uh, with the, hard work, the realities of hardworking Ontario families. We have to bridge that gap. We are responsible to hold the government to account. When they're not providing the information necessary to do that job, we have an obligation on behalf of the people of Ontario to make the case. We're doing that. Uh, we're performing our duties as an opposition. The government doesn't want to release those documents for whatever reason, and we think they're hiding that reason. Um, but that's their choice, and Minister Bentley has every opportunity to come clean uh, with the people of Ontario, with his role in this and other people's roles if he wants to come forward with that. So it's not about us not wanting the pre uh, on, on a partisan witch hunt. It's why is Minister Bentley continuing down this path where he's simply being a fall guy for a premier that's lost touch with and Ontarians. And last question, Rob. Where do you think this all ends up? Well, you know, at the end of the day, I think that uh, we're going to go to committee, hopefully, uh, soon that's going to, we're going to draw out and uh, ask for not only ministers who are responsible for energy, but also these political operatives, these nameless, faceless people who made political decisions to move, uh, move power plants to save Liberal seats at a cost of over a billion dollars to Ontarians. But I think ultimately where this is going to end up is in the court of public opinion. Uh, do they still trust this government to, to carry out its functions? I think that they don't. I think that they have serious doubts about the credibility of a government that's spending billions of dollars of their hard-earned money uh, on, on things that actually aren't, not, there's no power plant in Mississauga or Oakville. Well, you know, these are things billions. that are, We don't know it's billions yet. We don't know that. Well, look, uh, in the latest documents that we've seen, there's certainly has evidence that, that, that this is over a billion dollars just for Oakville. So uh, at our, our latest count, before these documents were released, we're already at $650 billion, million. Uh, The documents reveal that they're over a billion now. Uh, let's the, I don't call think it, the government acknowledges that. I think they, the government they, they acknowledges, acknowledges $40 million for Oakville and, what, 190 or something for Mississauga? That's what they acknowledge. That's where they're at they're, right now. They're, they're or put that out there in the interest of fairness. It, sure. I mean, this is obviously you're hearing from the PC uh, MPP here. I'm not going to make any, any distinctions from that. But the, anyway, it's hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer dollar, uh, money. Uh, they're not going to build roads, bridges, schools, uh, hospitals. These are going to, for politically pur political purposes, to save Liberal seats. And I think taxpayers in Ontario demand greater respect than what they've got from this government, and that's the, the point we continue to make. You going to teach about this someday if you go back to university? Well, you know, I think the, uh, that's, that's definitely going to be the goal. I consider this my co-op term, so uh, hopefully when I get back to, uh, to university teaching, I will be able to impart this knowledge on my future students. Rob, it's good of you to come into TVO today and tell us your views on this. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.